Hi everyone, welcome to Tempting Fate, Patterns and Practices for Shareable Scripts and Functions. Um, as I said, this is kind of an update to a talk that I gave back in 2019. Back then it was called Bulletproofing, but that seemed like a little bit too much Tempting Fate, so I changed the title. I am, of course, Joel Bennett. Um, for those of you who came to this talk without knowing who I am, thank you. Let me introduce myself. I, um, I'm from upstate New York, via the grasslands of Guanacaste, Costa Rica. I have been jcool online since sometime in the 90s. Um, I'm currently the principal DevOps engineer at Home Depot, and I have been a Microsoft MVP for 14 years, an open source programmer for 25 years, uh, Christian for 40 years, bilingual for, I'm not telling you, um, what else? I um, You can find me on GitHub, obviously. There's a bunch of links down here so that you don't have to copy any links. But I'm also on Discord. How many of you have found our IRC or Slack or Discord community and gotten help there? Anyone? A few of you, yes. So thank you very much. Please come and help other people. Uh, you can also find me on Mastodon and sometimes on Twitter. I'm always happy to talk about PowerShell or programming or DevOps or software design or really pretty much anything. Um, but today we're going to talk about shareable code. So for what it's worth, I've been doing DevOps for a while, but I still think of myself as a programmer. Um, I'm a developer. I'm a hacker. I'm not an architect. Um, I've actually kind of worked a little bit hard to avoid becoming an architect. Um, Back when we used to do Iron Script, I was Battle Faction. Okay, so those of you who know what that means, um, we're going to be talking about design a lot today. But just keep in mind, the only reason we're talking about design is because we want other people to use our code. So I'm not a designer. This isn't a design talk, really. But I want to make our code shareable. So what do you think? What makes code shareable? Comments. Uh, Readability. Uh, parameters. Okay. I like all of those answers. I think, um, for me, I'm trying to find my mouse. For me, <laughs> the um, there's like levels to that to that question because when people ask me, well, well, what does it take to share? I'm like, well, we're talking about posting a snippet to the user group, or a gist. Or are we talking about making a repo on GitHub? Or are we talking about answering a question on Stack Overflow, right? But the number one thing for me is code that won't embarrass me. <laughs> right? If I'm embarrassed of it, I'm not going to share it. So now bear in mind battle faction, right? So for me, code that doesn't embarrass me doesn't mean it has to be pretty. It just means that it has to work. And if it doesn't work, it should produce useful errors. <laughs> um, so another thing is I want I want before I share something, I want it to be a command that other people can figure out, right? And by figure out, I mean ideally without having to read the whole code, right? Basically, I want them to be able to intuit from the name of the command and maybe from the parameters what it does, what they can do with it. And then the third piece, and this is kind of where we shift gears a little bit. Part of what I think of when I think of shareable code is I want the code to work well with other code, not just for other people. So it means the, uh, basically, if, if I ship you a module and there's command A and command B in it, and you want to pipe A into B and that doesn't work, for me, that's a failure. Because if you, if you intuitively think I should be able to pipe these together, then I want that to work. I don't want you to find out by piping it that it doesn't work, right? Which, incidentally, the only way you can find out that piping doesn't work is to actually pipe it, right? So, by the way, my favorite analogy here, and I almost put a picture of this, and then I couldn't pick just one. So Google desire paths on your favorite image search. Uh, 
I said Google desire paths. That doesn't work. But anyway, if you search for desire paths, you'll get all these pictures of lawns or parks where there's like a paved sidewalk and a paved sidewalk and a bunch of idiots that walk right across the middle and wore a path, right? Because they didn't want to go around, they wanted to go through. Um, and if you, there's a Reddit group dedicated to pictures of desire paths, and it's really hysterical because people will take the tiniest shortcuts, right? There's a, there's a picture where they have a, a corner, right? And the designers had put gravel around, like, you know, it's paved like this, and they had put a corner that was gravel so that when people took the shortcut, they wouldn't wear the grass out. And of course, people cut straight across like five feet to the right of that. That's what you're gonna do. But we're trying to anticipate that. And that's what I mean when I say things that work together, right? So moving on, we're gonna talk first about that code that won't embarrass you. So the first part of that is error handling. In PowerShell, it's obviously relatively acceptable to just let errors come out, right? Oh, pops an error, pops an error, throws an exception, whatever. We do that all the time. But the key thing is that you should be doing that by catching and rethrowing, not by just letting the error come out. And there are a lot of details I could get into about why that is. I even have a demo I could show you that I think I'm gonna skip. We'll come back to it if we get to the end of the presentation. <laughs> um, but essentially there are exception classes in PowerShell that can be suppressed with error action silently continue. But if you wrap a try catch around that line of code that says error action silently continue, all of a sudden the thing that you had suppressed turns into an exception. And the best part about that is it doesn't have to be you. You could write a function that works perfectly. You call some native command with error action silently continue. You try, you test your code every which way, and it always works, it never errors. And then somebody else calls your code, and somebody else calls their code, and that person heard about my talk and put a try catch around it, and all of a sudden, <laughs> your thing threw an exception. So that's not every exception, by the way. There are a set of different cases. So you should plan for that. Basically, we're not got, this isn't an error handling talk. So the, I, instead of talking a whole lot more, I'm just gonna do this. Follow this template. Put a try catch. Can you all see that in the back? Kind of, okay. Put a try catch inside of each of your blocks. So process block, end block, begin block, whatever. Put a try catch around it. Put your code in the middle, and at the bottom, throw. The idea here is if you want to actually handle an error, like if you know there's an exception that could happen and you know how to recover, put that inside where it says code here, right? This, this thing on the outside is the last ditch sort of, okay, everything that I knew how to, to think of ahead of time, that's not what happened. This was something unprecedented. Now you can do way better than just rethrowing, but at least with rethrowing, you know that you're in control of what happened. Because when that, if somebody else catches it outside, right, it doesn't just break out of your code, it breaks out of the function that was calling you, and like there's a whole lot of stuff that gets skipped. So bare minimum is this rethrow, um, but let, you know what? Let's look at a let's look at a real real world example. Oh, that is way bigger. All right, so you're not. You're not. Oh yeah, we'll send it over. We're gonna just switch to duplicate for a minute. Um, all right, so how many have a prompt function that is not the default prompt function? All right, maybe you've seen this. So here's my prompt function. Uh, it's just a string. Uh, 36 is the light cyan, 37 is dark gray. So I'm printing out the invocation history ID, which is the ID in history of the command that I'm about to write, and then the path, and then this little caret thing, right? So that's my whole prompt. What if my prompt throws an error? Do you guys know what happens? So here, let's, let's do this one step at a time. I'm gonna write an error out. 
Does anybody know what happens when I hit enter here? Okay, you'll find out. I get a prompt. No errors, nothing, right? You never know. Now, if that error happened in something that was supposed to produce additional output, that output doesn't show up, but that's it. Now, what if I throw an exception? Oops. So now, still no error, but I don't get my prompt anymore. Now, the weird thing about that to me is that my prompt actually already output, right? If you know anything about how PowerShell pick marks work, the output already happened when the exception happened. So I could have gotten the prompt, but PowerShell decided not to show me the prompt in this case. So essentially what they're trying to give you, the really, really subtle hint is, hey, you see that PS arrow? That means something went wrong in your prompt and you should investigate. So now you're stuck on get error, what happened? Ooh, we should type it right. Oh, look. Somebody threw water balloons, of course. Um, so how could this be better? I'll show you my prompt. So Powerline is a module that I wrote for prompts. When Powerline, your prompt turns into dollar prompt. Dollar prompt is an array of script blocks, right? And each one of them gets stuck together and output. And Powerline puts the little you know, angle brackets and does coloring for you. So you can see this is basically the same prompt that we had a minute ago. It's my history ID, the path, except this time I'm using a function that's provided by Powerline to basically trim that path down so we're just seeing the curly. And then I'm writing I have PowerShell because why not? So now let's, let's see what happens when I have an error in here. Cool. Oh, come on. I was trying to take a shortcut, and that's not going to work here. Stay on the gravel. Yeah. All right. So we're going to do... There. All right. So I'm going to... You see I'm using index 0. With, because this is an array, when you add something to your power line, you can tell it where to go. So I'm putting it at the top, right? And you see this time, I actually get, immediately I get a warning. There was an error in one of the prompt blocks, check dollar prompt errors to suppress the message. I can, I can do that. So I can actually, if I don't want to see this, I, I don't care if I want it to act the way the PowerShell line does, I can just run that. No error, same as PowerShell, right? Um, interestingly, if we add an exception, uh, now this time I'm doing index minus one to put it at the bottom because that's what I did last time on the other prompt. Still no error. And hey, look, you still get a prompt. Um, now, hiding errors is a terrible plan, so let's not do that. Um, in Powerline, you're gonna get your prompt. You're gonna see two errors. You can investigate them. Let's see what that says. It says try prompt, prompt errors. So here you'll see, look, we got two errors. One came from the zero and one came from five. Those are, you know, the index of the prompt blocks in the array. And it's still telling you, oh, you know, I got another error, right? But you can obviously do get error and all that. Um, in my case, I'm just gonna remove those. But my point here, and we'll go back to, in fact, here, let's do this. Go back to the slides for a bit here. Um, the point here is that you can choose how your errors happen. In the case of Powerline, I can't handle these errors in any meaningful way. I have no idea what they are because you or whoever is using the module wrote the code that actually threw an error. So there's nothing I can do about it except make it not break things, right? So that's what I did. I, ca I captured it, I put it in a collection, and then I put that collection global so that you could access it, and I told you about it. Um, that's kind of what I'm going for here. But again, bare minimum, just rethrow. So, pass that and that. Ooh. That was a key I didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
Step two for not getting embarrassed is sharing is caring. So we're talking about shareable code. The first, the next thing after putting everything on try catch, the next thing I want you to do is log everything. And I just mean kind of everything. And I don't mean always log everything. I mean, make it so that it's possible to find out what happened, right? So that might mean write verbose, might mean write information. I'll show you in a second why I like write information. Um, but essentially every, uh, in an ideal world, every time there's an if block, you know, something that doesn't always run, put a line in there. Um, and that way, when something goes wrong, people are able to figure out where it happened, right? So I'll, do, I'll give you another demo here. And I, I realize now that I shouldn't have come back to this mode. I should have just stayed where I was. All right, so let's just close that terminal. All right, so I have, I have this presentation. And there's a, there are some uh, there's some demo slides. You see the ones with the numbers there. Um, I'll probably make this bigger. Can you see that in the back? Yep. All right. Um, so we're gonna look at the logging. Um, I'm gonna just do cat 3 logging. Right. So this is the example that I just had on the slide. Um, basically, I'm not. I added one thing to what was on the slide. It didn't fit on the slide. Please don't throw. So there's a switch here that says, please don't throw. If you call this, um, it throws horseshoes. I don't know why, right? Just happened. So because I am logging, I can do this. Now, I, again, forgive me if you don't know this, the information stream that I'm logging to, right information logs to it, the information stream. The information stream is the sixth stream in PowerShell. So what I'm doing here on the end is I'm redirecting, I'm gonna actually do this so that you can see it better in the back. I'm gonna actually do, redirect the sixth stream to a log file, right? So now when I get an error, I can cap the log and we can see it says entering logging and then it says, please don't throw was false. So, horseshoes, all right. Now I think I have a better idea of what went wrong. But now I'm gonna show you something. Don't get too excited about this. Uh, I have a module. And, and this is kind of what I mean when I say make things, make it possible to log things, watch this. Set, what is it? Set info template. Uh, yeah, let's use that one. So I am setting a template here. You can see in the template, I've got PS computer name and clock time, some other stuff. We're gonna just run the same line as before, log it the same way. And now we're gonna cap that log again. What? Right? Now we've gone from three lines to each of those lines has the name of the computer it ran on, the time stamp, and on the end in purple, <laughs> That's magenta, by the way, it's, you know. Um, in purple, the location in the script that, the, that that line was logged from, okay? All that information was actually just there because I called right information and I have this module that lets me format it. And you can see in the error, I've got like the whole stack trace and everything because again, all the information was in the error. In fact, funny thing about this, uh, information logging is if you do this, IV drip. Have any of you seen this? No. So information automatically goes to a variable because it's a stream, right? You can do this with errors and warnings. So now I have this drip. I always use drip because IV. Oh, yeah. um, drip actually has that whole thing in it, right? So my format is formatting it, but we can actually do like format table and oops, what well, we can do format table force, and we can see it in, in, it's only showing you the message data, right? So if we do format table star or format list star, you can see there's a whole bunch of properties on this thing, the source, the time, tags, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of extra information on the right information 
object. And the key thing is that write information doesn't log text, it logs objects. So when I did that write information dollar underbar inside the in, inside the exception handler, I actually got the whole exception object with all of the properties and sub properties and so on. So I can actually export this drip to an XML file, like export CLI XML, right? And then I can rehydrate it later if I need to investigate. All right, moving on. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna risk going back to slide view. We'll see if I can stay in slide view for very long. I I was going to say at the beginning of this that I wasn't going to do any demos, but obviously I'm not good at that. Um, so at the end of the day, let's in summary, always try catch around all your blocks. Rethrow by default. If you don't have anything better to do, just try catch throw. Always log, especially exceptions, but the information stream counts for logging. You don't have to get really complicated. You don't need third-party logging modules. Just make sure that it's possible for you. If somebody calls you and says this crashed, you can say, oh yeah, put dash information action continue on there, and now you'll see the whole stream, right? Or import Joel's information module. Yeah. Using just that as a basic, you know, okay, I always do that, and throw where do you set your um, continue error action So you're always getting your throw to work. Now. Yeah, so I, I recommend, I recommend that you always test your code with error action stop because somebody's gonna use your code that way. I don't recommend setting it. And the reason is because, especially if you're using third party modules, error action stop does weird things. Uh, not everybody is going to have heard me say, I recommend you test your module with error action stop on it. And it does weird things. Um, I tend to prefer to leave the error action alone by default when we do things like build scripts, where if something goes wrong, there's no point in continuing, we turn on error action stop. Um, but I don't do it as a general practice. Um, I usually just use that try catch. Um, if those of you who remember Kirk Monroe, he was the one I back and forth with him about this try catch thing. He always said, first line inside the try catch, error action stop, make all your errors into exceptions. I'm not really into that because it really does, like now you have to suppress errors on every command where you don't want it to throw, right? And you end up having to handle exceptions a lot more often because a lot of things that would otherwise be minor um, or ignored will turn into errors. So I think it depends. I, like I said, always test it that way. Make sure that you have run your command with that error action on so that somebody else doesn't do it first. Um, but I don't normally, yeah, I don't normally do it by default. Um, yes. Well, a trap or the try catch. Cause yeah, and, and that is a, that is a good point. In the old days, we didn't have try catch. You can use a trap at the top of a begin. You just write trap and curly brace. Like literally you could write trap, curly brace, throw, dollar under bar, close curly brace. That's the same as wrapping the whole block in a try catch. There is a performance penalty to doing that um, because it doesn't actually, <laughs> trap doesn't technically wrap the whole block in a try catch. What it technically does is it wraps every line in a try catch <laughs> because in trap, you have the option of saying continue. And when you continue, it just goes on to the next line from where the exception was thrown. So if that's what you want to do, that's great. But bear in mind, it does have a performance penalty because you're literally putting a try catch on everyone. Any other questions? All right. So now we're going to go on to the sort of helping people, commands that work together, right? Commands that people can figure out. So to me, shareable code means you've got to have these commands that make sense. Um, a lot of making sense is about designing good interfaces. Uh, interfaces for people and interfaces for commands. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the process for designing that interface. So how we decide what to write. Um, again, that, that battle faction part of me, 
I want to write commands that people with some power shell experience can figure out. I'm not usually targeting absolute newbies. Um, I kind of tend to assume that PowerShell newbies are learning on get command and get help and that they don't need to learn on my commands. Uh, but we still need to think about how our commands are going to be used, right? So do some brainstorming. In a sense, how do you want to use your command? How do you think other people are going to use your command? What commands exist that other people will want to use with your command? And how are you getting the values from those commands into your parameters? Are they going to want to pipe some random PowerShell command into yours? How about this? What are you doing with the output? Like, when you use your command, what are you going to do with the output? Are you going to pipe it into something? Are you going to save it in a variable? Are you going to format it for display? Think about those things, and, and as you're doing that, start writing down concrete examples of your answers to those questions in pseudocode. Basically, you know, kind of write out what, how you think you want to call it, and maybe even write out what the answer would look like, like what the output would look like. And while you're doing it, write it like this. <laughs> <laughs> right? You guys all recognize this? Comment-based help, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is, at the very beginning, you got to figure out what the name of your command is. Next, start writing examples. Don't write anything else. Write your examples first. Because this is what you need to do. You need to think about how am I calling this? What are the different ways that it might be used? Now, I'm not trying to get you to think about, like, you're not going to come up with every example off the top right at the beginning, right? And you're not, um, you're not going to write all the help right now either. Please, for example, well, actually, we'll go to the next slide. Look at this. First, write help. Write a synopsis. Describe your command in a sentence instead of just verb noun, because that will help you think about what your command's job is and what's not your command's job, right? Um, I do want you to write a full description for your commands, but not until you're done, because the description's going to end up changing if you write it too early. Usually, the synopsis you'll be able to stick with. The second piece is those examples that we were just talking about. Make sure that you write an example. So if you have multiple parameter sets, there should be at least one example for each parameter set. Not for every parameter, mind you, but for each set. And make sure, obviously, the point is when you write an example for a parameter set, you show how to provide the default, va the, the mandatory values for that parameter set, right? And then explain why this is a parameter set, right? Um, and then, and, and, and then um, the documentation for parameters, uh, write it as a comment above the parameter de definition. Don't write dot parameter in the name, because if you put it as a comment directly above the parameter in the, in the function definition, you will remember, well, you will be more likely to remember to update it when you change your mind, right? So a lot of times if you write your docs way up at the top or way down at the bottom, that you'll forget to update things. So as much as we can, keeping the docs as close to the code as possible. What else? Um, let's look at uh, tests. So think about tests as the next step of documentation. So I'm not going to do. I'm not going to talk. This is like the slide for testing. Okay, I'm not talking about testing here. There's so many other testing talks, but. In the concept of documentation, think about your tests as documentation. The point is, at least for each one of those examples that we just put in our docs, write a test that ensures that the output of running the example is what you documented that it would be. Does that make sense? That way, if you ever change it so that the output is different, you will be forcibly reminded to update your documentation. right? So just make, for each of your examples, write a test that calls the code exactly the way you wrote it in the documentation and verifies that the output is the same as what you wrote in the documentation. If you're not writing tests, start writing tests. Grab a tester, read a little bit about acceptance tests and BDD. Well, Glenn Sardi told me I was talking about DDD, Document Driven Design. This is, um, so, about parameters, right? We were talking about parameters. We need to pick good names for our commands, right? 
We're kind of forced to do that with this verb noun thing. But you also need to pick good names about your parameters. Parameters are not just user interface. They're also the API, if you will, right? So um, it's not just about what a human has to like figure it out, but it's also the interface by which one command interacts with another. Because when you're taking things on a pipeline, the parameter names have to match the properties of the object that's coming in in order for things to work out the way you want them to. So there's a lot of thought that can go into that. Um, I want to talk about it a little bit. So um, we looked at an example, a little snippet of a minute ago for a command called get information. Oh, and I'm ha. How are we going to do this? All right, we're we're giving up on the thing again. I'm really bad at not doing demos. All right, so. Uh, <coughs> This one. So this is, I'm going to close that. This is import configuration. So this is actually a function that is in my configuration module. Um, it's intended to be called inside another module or from outside if you're trying to figure out what the configuration is for a module that supports this configuration concept. So right now, I've written some examples about how I think it would be used. And you notice this example here. I, I would like my power line, the module that we were looking at earlier uses the configuration module to store the configuration. So when you set your prompt, then you can export your prompt. And the next time that you import the module, it comes back, as you saw on, on my screen when I imported it, it came back already configured because it actually saves the configuration to disk. And the way that it does that is by calling export configuration. And when it starts, it calls import configuration. But you can call it from outside like this, get module power line and type it into import configuration. And then you can like change stuff and then call export configuration and put it back on disk. So you can easily reconfigure the module from outside the module, right? So this is my idea. So I have this parameter. It's called module. Is that the right name for this module? For the, I mean, for this parameter? So could it be, what if I wanted to pass a name in instead of an actual module object? Or maybe I can only accept module objects. But I, I was thinking about this and I said, well, I could write an argument transformation on here so that you can pass a name and I'll call get module for you and find the actual module info, right? So I could write an argument transformation and then module names would be acceptable. But if, if I only take module info, maybe I should call it module info or PS module info. I reject PS module info because it, sound, it has that prefix on the front that sounds like it's like, you know, it's Microsoft, so I don't want to do that. So I'm going to call it module info, I was thinking. And I'll tell you what put me over the edge to using module. This example. So when you do get module, it outputs a PS module info. It comes in. That's fine. That's this, if you're not familiar with it, value from pipeline. But I also put in value from pipeline by property name because it dawned on me that if I do get command, commands have a property called module that has a PS module info object. So now I can call get command and pipe those things in. And because I'm doing by property name, it'll bind that property named module that is a PS module info, right? So as I'm thinking through all these things, I'm thinking about what the name of my module, what my name of my parameter is going to be. So, uh, full screen. Uh, we have this, I mean, I wrote this all down here, right? But um, the, the key is you want to think through those use cases. It helps you to determine what your uh, parameter names are. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more. What makes a good parameter name? Um, and I'm going to go into each of these in detail because I have a couple minutes left. The first thing is recognizable and specific. So path is good, but if you actually want a file path or a directory path, be specific. Don't just say path, because people won't know that you mean directory path. Implicitly typed. So that means say something in the name of the parameter that tells people what it is that you want. 
file, for example, I might mean a path, or I might mean a name, or I might mean a file info object from git child item, right? Uh, but file path is very clear. I wanted a string with the whole path to the file. Timeout versus timeout seconds, right? Because if I just say timeout and it's an int, what does it mean? Is it seconds? Is it minutes? Is it hours? I don't know. Color, color name, you now know you can probably pass red. But if it just says color, maybe it takes a hex value, right? Um, mine, I'll take RGB color which is a class from pansies, but never mind. Uh, the fun thing about the pansies RGB color, by the way, is that it actually converts from any of those. So you can pass red or FF0000 and all those work. Uh, distinct. So distinct, what I mean is try to avoid having a bunch of parameters that start with the same prefix. So Here's an example you might recognize, allow clobber and allow pre-release, right? If you're trying to call a command and it has these two parameters, when you type dash, you have to type the whole thing out because if you hit tab, it's, you, you, you're gonna get the wrong one first and you're gonna, oh, 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 tab, 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 tab. Um, so if you, uh, and again, I don't know if you know this, hopefully you do, in PowerShell, you can type as little of the parameter name as is necessary to make it distinct. You don't have to tap complete the whole thing when you're at the command line. So you can just type, if it was called ignore command name and allow release, you would have typed dash i, and that's it. You wouldn't have to type the whole rest of it. So avoid similarity, avoid duplication at the front. And avoid uncommon, name, uncommon terms. One of the things to keep in mind through all of this is that you can, you want to be consistent. You want to use the same parameter names for the same thing on all your commands, especially within a given module, but also consider what people are familiar with from the built-in commands, right? So when you have, for example, get child and it has a dash path, that's, probably enough of an excuse for you to use dash path on yours when you mean directory name or directory path, right? Because people know intuitively what that means. So keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that if you're outputting objects and you have a parameter that comes in, it's gonna go out as a property on your object, try to match those names up so that people can immediately recognize that it's the same thing on both ends, input and output. Um, and again, the properties that we were talking about before, match properties to parameters means you can pipe things in. Uh, one of the things that I always tell people is, if you can, when you can, always just write the process block. So start, you saw my template before, I actually put the process block in there. I didn't use the default because the default for whatever reason is the end block. If you use the end block, then pipeline input just really doesn't work. So you want to start by writing process block. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. The big one is performance. Um, if your command can be called once with multiple things picked to it, it means that that command object, you know, remember PowerShell is an object-oriented programming language. Your function or your commandlet is an object. So when PowerShell has to call it, they have to create an instance of your command. If you have to, if, if calling your command in a pipeline means I have to use for each object and call you, that slows everything down. Because now I have to, first of all, I have to involve that for each object command. But secondly, I have to call your command over and over and over and create a new instance of your command each time. Whereas if you can pipe things in, we just create one instance and we call the process block over and over. The catch, of course, is that sometimes there's things you need to do just once. So when you're optimizing, you want to optimize the process block by taking things out of it, right? Because that process block is the part that's going to run over and over and over. So take out the parts that you can. Remember, begin and end, run only once. Begin runs before there's any pipeline output, or pipeline input, rather. Begin runs before there's any pipeline input. End runs after all pipeline input. 
What that means is that if there's something that you need to do where you need all the pipeline input, you can collect the input in your process block and handle it at the end in your end block. Um, but more importantly, if you have like stuff that you need to do to set things up to create big expensive objects or whatever, do it and begin, tear it down and end, or the new block, I can't remember the name of clean up, something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, if you need to if you need to validate inputs as much as you can, any input, any parameters that aren't valued from pipeline, you should validate in the begin block rather than the process block because you don't want to revalidate the same thing over and over and over again, right? And lastly, maybe um, customizing output. So. I'm not saying you have to write classes. Classes are great. But at least set the PS type name. If you're outputting a PS object, like just a you know custom PS object, or a hash table, don't output hash tables unless you really have a good reason. If you got a hash table, cast it to a custom PS object, PS custom object. And when you're doing that, make sure one of the properties that you set on that hash table that you're casting the PS custom object is PS type. The reason is PS type name allows you to do two things. One, it allows you to write formatting for that type name that controls what things look like in the output, right? How PowerShell renders it. If you don't have a type name, you can't customize the, the formatting. And the other thing is it allows you to use that as an input restriction on a parameter later. So I don't know if you know this. If you write a PowerShell class, so let's say my I'm, I've got a PS object, I've got three properties, it's, I'm going to call it user, right? If I write a class user, then when I'm writing a parameter, I can say square bracket user, right? But if I put it in a PS type name, I can't do that, right? Because it's not really a class that PowerShell recognizes, so I can't use that square bracket user. What I can do is um, that, see at the bottom, constrained with PS type name. So you can actually put that PS type name attribute put the name of a type that you only added as a decoration in a, in a PS custom object. So you have this ability to, um, whether it's, you know, whether you're building PowerShell classes or PowerShell enums or just using dynamic objects, you can use that to constrain your parameters. Um, and we talked about this enough, I think, um, so I, do you have any questions? I have a couple minutes, I think. Yeah, I do. No questions. Go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts on using dash computer name versus dash host name? Or do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, dash computer name versus dash host name. So I would use computer name. And the reason is simply it's it is more common in the in the core commandlets, um, and also as soon as when I say computer name, I know that it has an alias for cn. By the way, you guys know that you can decorate a parameter with square bracket alias and put aliases on there. You should do that, especially if you're using things like computer name that has like all the built-in core commandlets have computer name, but you can push dash cn instead of typing the whole thing out. So I would definitely do that. I would also do my darndest to make it an array because all the built-in ones are like that, right? I think that if I couldn't do those things for whatever reason, I might choose to name it something else just to make the contrast, you know, so people don't think it's gonna work that way, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I would always default to computer name, yeah, just because I feel like that's the common thing on the core command. Anybody else? If you're taking AD input, that doesn't work well. If you're taking AD input, yeah. yeah it's kind of so, AD. So right. Like yeah. Yeah. And and it and it is you can use aliases to match value from pipeline. So if you're using if you're using a parameter that's value from pipeline by property name, if, and your outputs don't have the right name, you can put an alias on there, and PowerShell will figure it out. Um, sometimes. That ends up 
resulting in collisions. Like we were talking, I was talking about before about having distinct parameters. Um, if I have a situation where I have two parameters that need to have really similar names in order to match inputs on the pipeline, I will use a I will use more distinct names and put aliases on to do the matching. And the reason is because the aliases don't show up in the help. And so people, the, the aliases will make the pipelining work, but the names that people will have to learn will be the more distinct ones. And that's what they'll type, that's what they'll get in tab completion and so on. Did you have a question? I was going to comment on the, the, the host name versus computer name because if you are acting on computer names, I, I totally agree. If you're if you're doing remoting, then it depends on the right remote. Right. Yeah. yeah. Again, again, follow the patterns. Yes, exactly. And that is the one of the key things. Like I'm, I'm always trying to make sure with like I said before, it within your module be consistent. One of the things I didn't talk very much about is when I'm writing a module, when I get ready to publish it for the first time, I try to remember to review and look at the verb nouns that I've chosen and see if I can reduce the number of nouns. Because sometimes you'll write a series of commands and you will create, you know, two nouns that are very similar to each other. When you're writing them, it makes sense to you, but when you look at it afterwards, you're like, oh, I could use the same noun for that and it would be okay. And I might just have to change a couple lines of logic to make it make more sense. But if I can reduce the concepts count, right? Name, nouns are concepts. So if you can reduce the concept count in your module by, by having multiple verbs with the same noun, instead of maybe instead of having like a series of different uh, commands with different nouns, but the same verb, like new, 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 new. Um, if I can use the same noun and use different verbs, that reduces that concept count for people. Um, and again, especially when you're trying to match up the, the name of the command, the noun of the command with the object output of it. Reducing those, the more you can reduce those, the easier your module is to learn. All right, that's my time. Thank you.